Great. Uh, now, uh, you guys are in computer science department. Let's say you take your job and your first assignment is to make an algorithm which predicts weather. What does it mean? You go to, let's say, what is your favorite city? Dehradun, okay? You go to Dehradun and then you know that with probability P, the day is sunny, with probability 1 minus P, the day is cloudy, right? And then you make your algorithm which says, okay, is the next day going to be cloudy or sunny? But now you are a machine learner, right? So in that sense, if you are in Dehradun for let's say next 10 days is, and you see the behavior, you would assume that your algorithm should become better, right? That's what a machine learning algorithm does. It sees more and more data, and then in some sense, it tries to be a better predictor, right? So if that happens then, now, what will be your prediction about? Is the question clear? Right? There's a simple question, simple algorithm for weather prediction. This, these kind of things. I've taken weather prediction. It could be figuring out whether, you know, some operation will kill someone. It could be about whether India will win against Australia, whatever. The idea is that you had some probability of this decision variable, whether one or zero, and then you see some data. Right? And now you want to figure out what is the actual value of P after 10 days. Let's say, for example, you see seven sunny days and three cloudy days. What would you like to do? So you will say, I don't know the answer, resign from the job and come back to your hometown. See, don't worry. See, again, this kind of a problem, this does not have any best answer. Okay. So what do you think? Suppose you have to decide. You have to go for a trek. You decide whether the next day is sunny or not. If it is sunny, then only you want to go to the trek. You have to take the decision. What would be your, uh, what would be your decision? How would you... Any ideas? Okay, good. So how many people see that this is the problem which we have already solved? Raise your hands uh, like really high if you, if you have seen it. Okay, one, two obviously. Others, okay, three. What is this? This is, this is Bayesian parameter estimation. You have a random variable, whether the day is sunny or cloudy, that's a, what kind of a random variable? Bernoulli random variable. With success probability, the, the, the probability of getting ahead is P. You see 10 data points, 7 sunny days, 3 cloudy days. And then you want to decide what is your new assumption or what is your new belief about the probability Right? I'm not saying this is the only way to do it. And as I said, this is not the only correct answer. Okay? I wouldn't say this is Bayesian parameter estimation. This is parameter estimation to start. Right? You have some hidden variable. You have this hidden P. This is the parameter. And you want to find out what is the value. Can you think of some other strategy to figure out what is P? Let's say if you saw seven sunny days and three cloudy days, what will be your best guess for P? Uh, 7 by 7 by 10, right? So why did you get 7 by 10? Can you mathematically justify it? Seems very natural, right? All of you kind of almost in synchronization said 7 by 10. Uh, so this is what we call maximum likelihood estimator, which is max over theta probability of D given theta. 
okay here we are again treating treating theta as a number okay and if you try to maximize it again this is not part of your uh, uh, syllabus or anything i'm just just explaining it you know to just uh, compare it with bayesian parameter estimation so in this case theta was a hidden number right and then we wanted to figure out the value of theta and then we say okay whichever thing maximize this quantity that should be my theta right and then you can actually easily write probability of d given theta you want, you maximize it and see that theta is equal to 7 by 10 okay so these are called maximum likelihood estimator but some people will argue again there are two different beliefs in one case you would want to get a number and some people would say this is not uh, capturing everything the better idea is bayesian parameter estimation where we want to figure out theta as a random weight right so as mentioned we will have a prior input prior distribution on theta we get d and then we have a new belief of p of theta given p right and we saw last time that uh, it's a good idea to take p theta as beta distribution when we are talking about bernoulli distribution because the prior the posterior will also come out to be beta distribution okay so this is a very very natural problem which you can frame in terms of and there are many many such problems in machine learning which can be framed as either maximum likelihood estimator or bayesian I don't want to get into a debate of which one is better. These are two ways in which you can make your answer. But okay, ultimately, did you solve the problem? You got this probability theta given d. But what is your answer? Is the next day going to be sunny or cloudy? How will you figure out? You see the problem, right? Ultimately, I wanted to decide whether the next day is going to be sunny or, or let's say I want to figure out, come up with a value of theta. If theta was more than half, I would have said sunny. If theta was less than half, I would have said cloudy. But here I'm getting a distribution on theta, right? P of theta given D. Then how can I decide? What are the ways? Again, there is no correct answer. Can you think of a way to decide? Right, so whichever theta maximizes this quantity, p theta given d, right? That's a natural choice. Anything else? Expected value of theta. Correct. These are all, all, again, I'm not saying anything is a, one of them is the correct answer. What I'm saying is, these are the ways in which you can answer the question. Okay. Before, in your life, you have mostly seen math questions or probability questions where there is one correct answer. Generally, in statistics, in machine learning, there is no correct answer. These are different fields in, in this sense, right? When you talk about machine learning, when you have to predict what movies will I like when Netflix has to make an algorithm, I can't say, oh, Shawshank Redemption is definitely better than Godfather. Right? It's just, you know, you have to, you have to kind of different. Both are some kind of answer depending on the context, depending upon what the community there believes, depending upon people's opinion, you would figure out which one seems to be a better answer? What is the better performance? But it's not always clear what is the correct answer. Okay. So again, if we get into the deep end of O, expected value or the maximum uh, P theta D for theta, which one is the better answer? Different ways, depending on the context, we can figure out what to do. Okay. And you're not a kid anymore, so you have to get into this situation. Life is like machine learning, not like theoretical computer science. You have to, there are no best answers. You just have to find something you are happy with. So, uh, these are the situations which will arise and you should be comfortable with this point. Okay, and yeah, now mathematically, how would we do it? This is something which we saw last time also. We said that the data is coming from Bernoulli distribution, but the parameter distribution was beta. The prior distribution was this beta distribution. 
If you don't know about beta distribution, you don't have to worry. You have to just remember this form. B alpha beta is a constant. Uh, the terms depending on the theta, theta to the power alpha minus one minus the beta minus one. Alpha and beta are parameters. Now you start with this prior, and then you know P d comma theta. Then you can apply base. Right, and I get that my new my my new belief should be distributed proportional to this quantity, and this is very very natural again because this is a beta distribution with alpha plus h successes and beta plus n minus h more failures. Right? What happened when I uh, when I uh, uh, tossed the coin and I got h heads and n minus h uh, when I toss a coin? H heads and n minus H tails. That means my number of successes increased by H. My number of failures increased by n minus H. So this is kind of, in some sense, justifying this whole approach, right? So Bayesian parameter estimation in case of Bernoulli is a nicely solved problem. This is how we do it. What is the use of alpha and beta? Why do we want alpha and beta? Right. Before you start your experiment, you might already have some kind of an information, right? To give you an example, suppose you want to try a new operation in a hospital. And you want to figure out, okay, what is the mortality rate? It is for some very critical disease. And you know that in other places, whatever data on an average in the country, 10% people die under this operation, right? And you also know when you look at the data of different hospitals, most of the time, the mortality rate ranges between 3% and 20%. This is what you know. You haven't tried the, the operation in your hospital. Then you try the operation in your hospital. And as you observe data, you want to start your change your belief. But your starting belief should not be uniform, right? Because you have this data. And now you see, you have two equations. One is that the mean should be 10%, right? And most of my probability should be considered between 3% and 20%. And again, this is the judgment I can say, oh, 90% of it should be considered between 3% and 20%. That will give me another mathematical equation. Mean is 10%. Probability is considered between 3% and 20%. This gives me two equations and I will figure out, what, what will I figure out? Alpha and beta from this data. That would be my prior. Then I will do the experiment. I will get the result. This many people died. Uh, when the operation was performed for like 100 people, and that will give me the new alpha prime and beta prime. And using those, I can take more decisions. Uh, how do I take again those decisions? As I said, you might take expected value, you might take maximum probability, whatever you want, but this is a matter of taste. But our belief will be updated like this. Okay, this is one way in which we do parameter estimation. It's a very, very striking example of Bayes' theorem, which will be used in machine learning, which will be used in computer science a lot of times. Okay, questions? Happy? Sorry? Uh, uh, how mean? So again, looking at the data, it kind of feels that the mean should be 10%. And by calculation, you can figure out that the mean of beta distribution is alpha by alpha plus beta. So then this is basically saying that alpha by alpha plus beta should be. And then again, you can write a similar equation. It's not, I'm not saying easy, but I'm saying philosophically, this is what you want to do. And write another equation in terms of alpha and beta. I'm not saying we can solve it always, but probably you can solve it and figure out alpha and beta, right? Or, yeah. Uh, let's, let's talk about it on, I don't have example at this point. Generally, integrating beta distribution, you know, this, this gives us gamma functions. It's not a great thing. So what we do is we kind of look at tables and figure out alpha and beta so that both these properties are satisfied. 
you know so that when you when you look at the gamma value between alpha and beta it comes out between 10 and 30%. but it's not actually solving mathematical equation it's some kind of an approximation yes yes that is that is why they are variable right that is why they are variable at the first place because if our prior information is different then our prior distribution should also be different it will always follow beta distribution form but the parameters are different make sense more questions okay then let's uh, start something uh, completely new if you remember why we introduced the idea of conditional probability because we wanted to talk about when you talked about joint probability distribution we talk about two events being independent of each other right so let's go into that let's let's go into that special case when events or random variables are independent of each other you want to study that in great detail okay and that's going to be our focus for uh, next few classes right and this is something which you now know right what was the definition of independence two events are independent if very nice right uh now uh, this is again you kind of see that this is dependent on conditional probability and what is the probability at two throws of dice give the same number if i ask you this question you can calculate the probability it is forget about this part 1 by 6 right okay great what if the first dice is prime shouldn't affect you can check that okay the probability will still remain 1 by 6 but it was not obvious right it will become obvious once we look at the once we calculate these things by definition what if some sum of numbers displayed is prime come on simple high school question i should ask it to high school students not you if the two throws of dice give the same number can the sum be prime okay okay one one yeah so okay <laughs> okay my fault i should go back to the high school but yeah so so very very special case but clearly this is dependent right once i tell you that sum of number displayed is prime then uh the two throws of dice almost will not give the same right so this is when i want to say that these things are not dependent they are, they are dependent on each other they are not independent similarly if you take a real life course you miss a class today what is the probability that you miss tomorrow seems related probably you are sick so if you miss today you might miss tomorrow or things like that right so there is natural that idea of defining independence and dependence between uh, between events and then we saw by making that nice diagram this seems to be the definition right these are the two definitions they are equivalent but we like this more because because this is symmetric it automatically gives us a proof that if a does not depend on b then b does not depend. that's why we can have the statement a and b are independent make sense right this definition kind of says a does not depend on b but from this definition we can talk about a and b being independent it's a symmetric quantity okay so just to make sure that we understand this you have a box it has two red balls two blue balls i uh, uh, i make two draws from this box and i'm asking are r1 and b2 independent okay right so the important question is with or with or without replacement what do you think it will be 
Okay, so let's just see what is the probability of B two given R one. Is it half? R one means first red ball is out, right? So this is two by three. What is probability of B two? Is there a guess? You can actually make a very sophisticated guess, right? Because it is symmetric, right? Number of blue balls and red balls are equal. So, given nothing, the probability that I my second draw is blue is it should be the same probability that my second draw is red. Some of them is one, so this is half. So they are not independent, right? In many of the cases, it will be clear whether two things are dependent or not, uh, whether they are independent or not. But the golden test, whether two events are independent or dependent, is by checking the equation. Yes, is P A intersection B equal to P A times B? That's when we say whether two things are independent. one of the confusion which people have i'm sure you have seen this before many of you will not have it but still i want to emphasize difference between disjoint and independent a and b are disjoint that means probability of a intersection b is zero that means they are highly dependent most of the time right except these trivial cases when one of the probability is zero this is this means a and b are in some sense highly dependent on each other independent means probability of a intersection b is pa times pb right and there is no need to get confused between these two right uh, why a and b are highly dependent because knowing so again when i said highly i wrote it in quotes because this is intuitively right if i know that a has happened then i can i'm sure that b hasn't happened that is why they are dependent on each other right if if uh, right so good good question so in some sense we should want to we want to say are they highly dependent or not right and the idea should be that i should compare these two quantities right if p a intersection b is less than p a times p b that means if a happens then b's probability goes down a is negatively affecting the occurrence of b if p a intersection b is more than p a times p b that means a is affecting the probability positively right and uh, uh, we will come to that these are called uh, negative correlated and positive correlated so this means a and b are negatively correlated and this means positively correlated right and now in this case p intersection b is zero which is the least possible way it's farthest away from p intersection right that's why in some sense i'm saying it is highly dependent again these are very natural things right negatively correlated positive correlated if someone tells you the names you can kind of figure out what they mean a is equal to b right so then p a intersection b will be at its highest value Is bounded by P A or right. okay. So my question to you: Great, I can talk about two uh, events being independent. How can I define two random variables being independent? Yes. 
Right. So remember, how do we go from random variables to events? What are the natural events corresponding to a random variable? Is it too simple a question or you don't, you forgot? This, right? This is a natural event for the random variable x. What is this event? All omegas such that x omega is equal to small x, right? This is the event b. There's something which we have seen before. And now a random variable gives rise to collection of events. And then two random variables will be independent if all of these events are independent. Okay. So then we would say that probability that x is equal to x and y is equal to y should be equal to and this should hold for all small x and y. Right? So a random variable corresponds to a list of events. You know that by now. And that's why when we talk about two random variables being independent, we will just apply it on each of the possible event. Okay, this will be our definition for two random variables being independent. Sounds good. Again, we can't ask, is this the correct definition? It is a natural definition. This is how we define it. But it seems natural to you, right? Notice that this also implies that probability x is equal to x1 or x2, y is equal to y1 or y2 will also be a product of this. So uh, I can say that probability x is in some set, y is in some set b of real numbers. Uh, this automatically follows from this definition. It's an easy proof you guys can do it. Okay, but yeah, this is the definition of random variables being independent. And I guess I should have this slide before random variable, but you know this now, right? When they are negatively correlated, when they are positively correlated. Now let's take an example. I toss a coin twice. My event A is first toss is head, B is two outcomes are same. Are they positively correlated, negatively correlated, independent? If there is a doubt, we calculate the probabilities, right? So calculate the probabilities. What is PA? What is PB? H, H, T, T out of four. What is probability of A intersection B? One by four. So they are independent. Okay. So if you are confused about the dependence, like in this case, it's kind of iffy, right? It, it kind of seems that, oh, if the first toss is head, then second outcome should also be head. Seems they are dependent, but Right. So, so whenever you are in doubt, then we'll apply these. Okay. Let's take a nicer, nice example again, kind of contradictions, uh, which arise. Let's say there is a hospital, which has, uh, only two kinds of patients, patients with diabetes and patients with asthma. Some kind of a journalist went there and did this survey and they found inside the hospital when they looked at people who had diabetes, they had less chance of having asthma as compared to, you know, probability of having asthma, in the general population. Is it clear what they observed? So from the previous data, they kind of knew that one out of 10 people have asthma. But when they looked among diabetes people in the hospital, they found one out of 20 had asthma. So it seems diabetes inhibits asthma. 
Yes. So, so they are negatively correlated. So do you think now, what is the explanation of this? That the diabetes bacteria, it's not bacterial thing, but whatever happens with diabetes that somehow suppresses asthma. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, yeah, so by now you should be convinced that when I write these kind of things, they have nothing to do with, with biology because I don't know anything about biology. So the explanation will lie with probability. So I will give you a minute and try to see why could, why could this be true. If you haven't seen it before, if you have seen it before, then, uh, then stay put. But you haven't seen it before. How many people have seen it before? If you haven't seen it, then think about it. Why, why would this happen? You can give intuitive answers also. We will make it formal. Sorry? Right, the sample space, uh, many people have uh, gotten this idea, the sample space is in some sense uh, not indicative of things. It is taking a, a space of only those people who have both either diabetes or asthma, right? So this should be the reason, very good. Now can we make it more precise? Let's say A is the event that people have asthma, D is the event that people have diabetes. What we know is that our sample space has now shrunken to A union D. Right? Because we are looking at the hospital. We are only diabetes and asthmatic patients are there. And then if we want to see whether A and D are uh, negatively correlated or positive correlated, actually in the hospital, we are looking at whether these events are negatively or positively. Okay. And this is a simple exercise. It is given in the notes also. You can easily show that if A and D are independent, then these events will be negatively correlated. It's a simple math. It's basically the probability of A union D. You will divide it, divide it by twice or something. That's, that's the simple idea, okay? You can just write the definition of these being, in, being independent or negatively correlated. You can look at this and you will see that these events will be negative. So this contradiction kind of happens because of this fact, because of choosing the wrong sample space, not because of any biological Okay, this is called Bergson's paradox. Okay. So you might have a doubt, how will you show this? But that is an exercise. But if you can mathematically show this, then you understand the reason of those survey findings, right? Is there any confusion? Please ask, ask questions if there is a confusion. Okay, so what we have learned is independence, positively correlated, negatively correlated, how yeah, changing the sample space can affect these relationships and how to check whether events are independent or not. But now coming back to computer science uh, from the hospital, uh, what we need is actually much more complicated notions of independence. And this is where we will spend more time. So let us start. You have defined when two events are independent, right? What was the definition? probability of A intersection B was equal to PA times P. Instead, I give you three events. Forget about N. Let's start with three events. 
what do you think should be the definition that a b and c are independent okay uh, so probably you have some information that's why you said that but first natural generalization seems to be this right why is this useless any any trivial example which makes this intuitively useless think of a and b being dependent in any way negatively positively correlated and take c to be an event with probabilities right what will this show that these three events are independent this definition will show that these three events are independent which is not really the case right intuitively if two events are dependent on each other third event is not then we should not say that these three events are independent that gives rise to what we already said pairwise independence so which is that p of a intersection b is p a p b and p c intersection right is that good enough this seems to only talk about two events together but it's not using the third thing so what if i take another stronger notion of independence seemingly stronger where 1 2 3 are there and this additional thing is there if you don't know the answer again if you have seen it before then please uh, be silent if you haven't seen it before what do you think is does it matter that i add this extra condition or these three things should imply the last condition take a minute think about it are these two notions actually different or these three conditions will automatically imply this condition you can do calculations in your copy if you want how many people know the answer to this yes you, you know the answer okay. okay how many people think that these two are different notions of independence how many people think these are the same notions of independence raise raise your hand hi yeah okay it's incorrect actually they are different notions of independence okay and we will see that okay so this is something which we have done we have defined different notions and we can generalize this actually to multiple events right so suppose i have events ai right is is this notation clear cardinality of i many events indexed by entries in i right if this is the case they are independent if for all i and j in i this is what this was our usual notion of independence right and this this is we are just saying now that if you look at any or any two they are independent this is pairwise independent k wise independent any idea what should be k wise independence actually anything less than equal to k okay and we will discuss that also but for all j subset of i such that cardinality of j less than k
okay you might be lost in the notation but it is basically saying that if you pick any subset which has less than equal to k elements the the probability of intersection will be multiplication of those probabilities right so they are two wise independent three wise independent four wise independent k wise independent, right k wise independent implies k minus 1 wise independent right because if you have checked this condition for all subsets less than equal to k then you have definitely checked this condition for all subsets less than k minus 1 i can i can go slow here but this should be clear to you that k wise independence implies k minus 1 right and okay so so let's take a simpler case right let's look at three wise independence two wise independence what was three wise independence here the last one right what is pairwise independence this pairwise is two wise independence so obviously three implies two if there were four events then i will have all possible pairwise conditions all possible three wise conditions exactly three wise and four wise right so i'm adding extra conditions when i'm talking about k wise independence of k minus so k wise independence implies k minus one wise independence and then uh, the last is mutual independence this is the strongest notion where this condition holds for all possible subsets so this is in some sense cardinality of i wise independence right okay this should cause a lot of confusion already we saw that our intuition was incorrect when we compared pairwise and threewise independence you haven't seen it i will give you an example that will finish it but still there should be lot of questions in your mind like why did we have these three kind of definitions are they different from each other where are they useful but in computer science these kind of definitions these will be useful and the trade off is very very simple what is the trade off when you want to prove properties of some xi right you remember summation xi by n we said that it was distributed like a cl central limit theorem bell curve right normal distribution now all these statements can be made much much stronger if xi have properties about them if they are mutually independent then we can talk about the behavior of summation xi by n with much more certainty right if we have more information about xi then we can get more information about it but then why would pairwise independence be important because in many cases we can only ascertain pairwise independence we have to work with these only this require less work to generate this requires more work to generate but i can do more things so depending upon whether you want more work to be done or is less work enough depending on that we take the notion of independence but the most important point is these are all different notions of independence they are not the same and for that so first does k k wise independence implies k minus 1 independence yes very very clear k wise independence implies k plus one wise independence we don't know <laughs> because i have not given you the example so can you give me an example can you come up with a b and c which are pairwise independent but not mutually independent matlab three wise independent right and the hint is you have seen those events in the class today Uh, have you seen the example before, or you are coming up with it now? 
like just in the class today. Okay, write the events, let other people think about it, then you can. So three events, which are pairwise independent, but not mutually. Try to construct them. The good thing is once we are done with that, we will be done with the class. And hint is you are tossing two coins. I think you already mentioned this. or head, it doesn't matter. So first coin is head, second is head. Are they independent? Sorry, first coin is tail and Yeah, yeah, so you can take first coin is tail also. Still, this will be a this will be an example. Uh, that is what you are saying, right? No, that we can't take because they will obviously be different. But first coin is tail, second coin is head. That we can take, right? And we saw in the class today that A is independent of C. That means B is also independent of C. So they are pairwise independent, but obviously not threewise independent, right? It is obvious to you that they are not independent because if given A and B, I already get C, right? So this implies that the, all the notions which we have talked about, as an example, you can try discuss with each other and come up with events which are K-wise independent, but not K plus one. It will be an interesting thing to try. Okay, don't look at internet. Try it on your own first. If you can't, then you can obviously look at internet. You can put it at hello. We can discuss on hello, but try to figure out. There is another question at hello. It's an interesting question. So if you try it, give answers on hello and see what. Okay. Anyway, uh, I will see you on Friday in which classroom? RM10. Okay, classroom will be changed from now on. This is in computer science building, right? The nice fancy new building with a nice fancy. Okay, thank you. If you have any questions, I'm here.